I have set a bit of outline of tonight's teaching on our WhatsApp group. So if you are on the church, WhatsApp group is there. And we are now in chapter 15. You can see how time uh, flies. We are in chapter 15 of 1689 of a 2nd London Baptist Confession of Faith. And the subject that chapter 15 deals with is repentance unto life and salvation. Repentance unto life and salvation. I choose to teach from chapter paragraph 3 tonight. Uh, usually we go from paragraph 1, 2, 3, I think there are about 5 paragraphs in this chapter, but I'm doing chapter paragraph 3 because the definition of repentance appears in paragraph 3. I understand why the framer, the, frame, uh, the framers of this uh, confession put one or two, the two paragraphs that precedes paragraph three. But I think it is fitting that we all learn what repentance is, what evangelical repentance is all about before we can talk about its application to different strata of persons that are uh, within the church. So the first paragraph deals with how repentance work in the life of those who come to faith in their later years, like those who became Christian and they are much, much older. Like if you become a Christian at the age of 50, only God knows the kind of stupid things you may have done. So the kind of crazy situation that those ones may face may differ for those who were born into a Christian home, went to Sunday school, went to a private school, never had the opportunity to exhibit sinful tendencies that were locking in their mind. And then paragraph two uh, talks about those who are Christians and then uh, those who are Christian and and fall into grievous sins, how repentance work in their, in their lives. And then chapter, paragraph three now deals with the definition of the terms itself. And then four and five deals with something else. But let me read paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, but we'll talk about, we'll just stand on paragraph three tonight. Paragraph one of the 1689, such of the elect as are converted at riper years, that is much, much, when they are much older years, having some time lived in the state of nature. The state of nature means the state of spiritual, state of natural man, the state of sin. And therein served diverse lusts and pleasures. God, in their effectual calling, giveth them repentance unto life. What that means is that no matter how much foolishness and dissipation uh, in lust that people suffer, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, whatever years they've en that endures, God, if they are elect, God will give them repentance. Because repentance is not, it's not, it's not effectual to the degree of the sin that the man has committed. The man that commit one sin and the man that commit one million sin need one thing, Christ. And if the man that commit one sin come to Jesus, he will save him. And if the man that commit one million sins come to Jesus, still will save him. I hope you understand what paragraph one is talking about. And the... Uh, the Scripture title chapter 3, verse 2, Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 10 to 20, Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 19, Acts 16, 29 to 30. Second paragraph. Whereas there is none that doeth good and sinneth not, and the best of men may, through the power and deceitfulness of their corruption dwelling in them, with the prevalency of temptation, fall into great sins and provocations. It should be expected that great men does fall. 
grievously. God has, in the covenant of grace, mercifully provided that believers so sinning and falling be renewed through repentance unto salvation. So paragraph one deals with those who come to faith at riper years as uh, older years, and paragraph two deals with when believer commits sin. God, one of the key components of the covenant of grace is the grace of repentance. So when a believer sin, I hope you are listening to me. If a, when a believer sin, the confession says the sin that believer, believers commit are sin. They're not, they're, there's no believer sin and unbeliever sin. The sin that believers commit are proper sin and thus carry the same weight of punishment. But God mercifully had provided in the covenant of grace that when believers sin, they may have opportunity to repent unto salvation. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. I'm just running through why they upload this before defining what repentance is all about. Okay, but let's get to paragraph three. That is where we'll just spend a little bit of time tonight and be on our way home. So we are looking at saving repentance or repentance, evangelical repentance. Let me just sample your opinion. How many of you understand what the word evangelical means? Raise your hand if you understand the word evangelical. One. Only one person. Is it that you are shy? You are not too sure. Okay, bro, Fred, what is evangelical? What does the word evangelical mean? It means it's, a, it's gospel. Gospel. Yes. Okay. Any any opposition? Evangelical it's from the word you are Galion. That is good news. Okay. Uh, you are Galizo, Greek. Talks about the the proclamation of the good news. So if a thing is evangelical, is as in as that thing, that thing is 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 relating to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. That is if you say evangelical repentance or an evangelical church, what you are saying is that if a church is evangelical, it is completely and wholly devoted to the totality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are talking about evangelical repentance. We are talking about the repentance that is, that is related to the gospel that found his foundation, that found his foundation, validity, and essence in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that clear now? Okay, let's read paragraph three. This saving repentance is an evangelical grace, whereby a person. Of course, the word evangelical can be expanded to mean a biblical church, okay, or not a biblical organization, okay. whereby a person being by the Holy Spirit made sensible of the manifold. It's my sound there. Is that the best you can do with the sound? Or I can use the hand. Uh, yeah. This civil repentance is an evangelical grace. Church, can you hear me clearly? It's, it's clear on the own side, from your side, okay, great. This saving repentance is an evangelical grace whereby a person being by the Holy Spirit made sensible of the manifold evils of his sin doth by faith in Christ humble himself for it with godly sorrow, detestation of it, and self-abhorrency, praying for pardon and strength for, of grace, 
with a purpose and endeavor by supplies of the Spirit to walk before God unto well-pleasing in all things. Amen. There are, if you are on WhatsApp, there's a picture I got from online that depicts repentance. So I actually cut this picture and place on your, in the back of your bed there. So you clearly understand what repentance means. When you look at these confessions, the first thing we learn, first of all, is the, the definition of repentance itself. So the entirety of what I've read in your hearing, that is what repentance is all about. Turn to Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Anyone? Acts chapter 5, verse 31. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Yeah. To give, I think the emphasis there is the idea of give repentance. Because the first thing you will see is that repentance is a gift. It's a gift. It's an evangelical grace, saving repentance. And that qualification needs to be elaborated or maybe, maybe uh, clarified to put a distinction between a saving repentance and a non-saving repentance. We all repent. The, the, the same principle when we learn about effectual calling, yeah? Not all calling are effectual. We also learn about saving faith, isn't it? Not all faith are, not all faith are saving faith. So it's repentance. Not all repentance are saving repentance, okay? You, we all repent sometimes. There are some things we used to do five years ago no gathering for some different reasons. Sometimes maybe you smoke and then you've learned, hopefully, it has finally registered in your mind that smokers are actually liable to die young. Of course, many of them don't really get that now, but you have gotten it. And I know many unbelievers who have repented from smoking a cigarette. So in that case, they've repented, they've turned from smoking cigarettes. But the repentance we are talking here is a saving repentance, which is an evangelical grace. Turn to Acts also 11, verse 18. Acts 11, verse 18. Mm -hmm. Acts 11, verse 13. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, send 18. 18. Okay, okay. 11 verse 18. Give us 18. When they heard these things, mm -hmm. they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles, also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Who granted them repentance? God. So it is a grant. Hope you understand the word grant. Hmm? A grant is what? Hmm? A grant is not trader money. A grant is a gift. So it's a gift. And finally, Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty-five. Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty-five. Of the truth. Yeah. Grant, grant, grant. Repentance is a gift. Write it boldly on a paper and place it on your wall. Repentance is a gift. And it works like this. 
is an evangelical grace whereby a person by the Holy Spirit come to an awareness of his plenty evil of his sin. Sin is wickedness and evil. And for the sake of Christ, humble himself, pour ashes on himself or herself. With, and that humbling of self is propelled by godly sorrow. And then you are, you are a detestation. You detest that sin. You hate all of your sin, all at once. These, these things are called crisis moments. When in one fell swoop, you, you have seen your sin. Thomas Watson called it the sight of sin. You have seen, you've come to the full awareness, a functional awareness of, your, of the manifold. Not just one sin. It's manifold, like your sin sees. If there's anything like that, everything, your sins. Not even the one now, way back. The Holy Ghost brings into your mind the evilness of your sins. And then it makes sense for the very first time that your sin is terrible and is an affront against God. It makes sense to you. You see, how many of you have heard this before? I didn't hear it. I used to witness it. Where a sister, there's a sister up front, please. Uh, people uh, in church who do something wrong, and then a pastor wants to confront them. Usually, what will be their, what is their usual line of defense? First of all, when you confront a brother or a sister with a grievous sin, what do you think usually they will say? Eh? I know many of you have not seen before. I mean, if you have not come before elders before, but just assume. What is the first thing they would ask the pastor or a brother? Or maybe a fellow Christian want to confront you, say, Sister, so and so, I heard you are doing this. What would be the first question? Huh? You don't know. It's like, who told you? It, 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 it makes sense now. So it is now the pastor trying to see when I trying to tell people when I trying to tell people that what they are doing is wrong. You are just being human. That's not saving talk. It doesn't work. I'm just telling them. But for the very first time, this person comes to an awareness, and the Holy Ghost is is picking their hairs. And for the very first time, it makes sense, really, really makes sense that sin is not good. And sin will kill me and put me to hell. And that crisis moment will turn you to Christ, who is your redeemer. And then in one situation, you are humbling yourself. You are having godly sorrow walking in your mind. Your peace is taken away. You want to drink alcohol, it don't work. Usually, before, before, if your conscience is a bit just disturbing you, a bottle of beer, you are, you are fine. You on your phone, nothing. You go and watch football just to make sure your conscience is not disturbing you. It don't work. God is already working on you. You start losing weight immediately. And then, all of a sudden, the sin that you used to love, there's a detestation of that sin. And then, there's abhorrency of self. So you're looking at yourself, and you stand in your bathroom, you see, look at your face. You wicked, though. You look at yourself, I'm so stupid. Nobody is telling you you are stupid. You are telling yourself how stupid I was, how foolish. How mad, 
How crazy. I was doing this. I was doing this. I was doing this. I was doing this. Sure. And then you, you, you start hating your own self. And then that whole, as since it is the Holy Spirit that is administering these bitter pills in your soul, it will inevitably lead to prayer. If it leads to suicide, it's not an evangelical repentance. If at this point you just say, okay, let me take uh, and die, that is not the work of the Holy Spirit. Because human beings can have that crisis moment without the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, EFCC is on your case. All of a sudden, somebody has hacked into your, your histories and then they are terrifying you that they will go on, they will go public with, with what they'll find out and say, okay, let me die. You know, the, we can come to a crisis moment without the aid of the Holy Ghost. But if it's the Holy Spirit that's working in the heart of a man, administering the bitter pills of repentance, which is a gift from God, very expensive gift from God, it will lead you to the point where you are praying for pardon. You are asking God for the sake of Jesus to pardon you. And then you are asking for strength of grace. And then you are making a commitment, you are proposing in your heart never to do it again. Of course, relying on the supplies of the Holy Spirit. At this point, now you are not making a resolution in and of yourself and say, okay, I can no, no. By the supplies of the Holy Spirit, through the means of grace, you are making a commitment not to do it again. Where all these things are not present, evangelical repentance have not taken place. I've put the definition, some working definition there. The Greek word for repentance in the New Testament, this is not my, just I got it from the internet. The Greek words for repentance in the New Testament are primarily meta Noel. It appears 34 times and metanoia 22 times. One that is in its noun and verbal uh, forms. These words have the meaning of changing one's mind. It means changing one's mind. So repentance means changing. There's seat in the front. There's uh, some seats here. Changing one's mind. Another word group that refers to repentance is strefo. And epistrefo, which has the meaning to turn and to turn about, both are usually translated as convert or to be converted. Metamelomai, meaning to become concerned about afterwards. It's also used with regard to repentance. This word group conveyed the idea of a person going one direction, having a change of mind, turning and going the opposite direction. So repentance is not a change of lane, it is a change of direction. From here to Wawalada, if you are on Lube Highway, we have like six lanes. You can be on the fast lane, and you can be on the middle lane, and then you can be on the service lane. So repentance is not a change from the speed and then to service lane. It's not a change of track. It is shuv, it's a turn. It's a turn. You are heading to Wawalada. And then you discover that the well, is not uh, a route to Joss. And then you turn. You are now heading, you are going south. Now you are heading north. It's a complete turn. It's a turn. It's a turn. It's a complete turn. That is the definition of repentance. I've uh, made mention of the nature of saving repentance is an evangelical grace. Acts chapter 5, we've read the scripture. It is a gift from God that accompanies justification. It is a gift. Unbelievers do not repent. They don't have saving repentance. 
There is no saving repentance with those who are not in Christ. The, and the reason why Christians will make it to heaven is that this repentance is incorporated in their justification. Because no sinner will go to heaven. No unrepentant sinner will go to heaven. Jesse Ryle, speaking about the nature of repentance, he said, the heart of a penitent, penitent means, what is penitent? Huh? Somebody who is pleading, who is begging, yeah. Is touched with deep remorse. You know, repentance is not remorse, but remorse is part of repentance. Penitent is not repentance, but penitence is component of repentance. Deep remorse because of his past transgressions. Say he is caught to the heart to think that he should have lived so madly. That's just around. And so wickedly. He mourns over time wasted, over talent misspent over God dishonored, over his own soul injured. The remembrance of this thing is grievous to him. The burden of these things is sometimes almost intolerable for the person who is repenting. The Holy Ghost brings to your awareness the following. Now, at the point of self-abhorrence, you are looking at, you are caught to heart. You are looking at your madness how mad you could be to have acted in this way while you were in the university. You're looking at how wicked you were, how you were able to carry this fire in your bosom for so long. You are looking at the time you have wasted. I mean, sin is a waste of time. I hope you understand that. Can you imagine spending four hours in the beer parlor, what those four hours could have done? In following Christ. You are looking at over talent misspent. You know, they are willow, you are dancing on top of your head. All the skill you employ into doing Eve, i.e., 419, all the time you are using to scam the magas. Imagine if that skill is put to a righteous use. The skill you put together to fly in the night, I you mean, use that into making cars, you know, that kind of an idea. Sin is time, time spent in vanity. As the song we sing, the I spent in vanity and pride, caring not that my Lord was crucified. See, sin waste our time. So you are now mourning over the time you have wasted over talent you've misspent, over God that you've dishonored. Because at this point now, the Holy Spirit is bringing to your fore the, 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 the holiness of God. And it's like, is it this God I've dishonored? So, for instance, I mean, if you have seen Nigeria, some, some comedy, you know, Nigerian comedy, where uh, this man came to report a case to a police station, and of course, or Sophia, what is his name? I forgot his name now. Who was the policeman? Yeah, in Kemo was the policeman. And the man said, one man has taken my sister. Come and help me do arrest him. And that he raped my sister or does some terrible thing to his sister. And so I said, so one man, let's go. And across the social now, as they are going, he's making a lot of outlandish statements. How is he going to deal with the man? How is he going to crush the man? How is he going to mess up the man? And then they came to the house of the man. And then the man came out, a weightlifter, seven foot tall. And then the social said, who are you? Who are you? And then, who are you here to? Hey, this man. Oh, this is a gentleman. Come on. This man can already, come on, let's go back with him. Like that. You have come to... You know you have beaten more than you can chew when it comes to dishonoring God. That's, that's, that's the feelings that should be going through your mind at the point of repentance. You have dishonored God. And then you have injured your soul. 
If you don't know the amount of injuries you brought upon your soul, you will think you are repenting so that damn they will be happy. That finally, all the time they'll be disturbing you to repent. You have repent now. She, you are happy. So you have done the church a favor. Hallelujah. You are now coming to church. And then church is happy. And God too is happy that you are finally saved. Of course, the church is happy. Heaven is full of joy over a sinner that repents. But most the soul, your soul that you've injured, you should be dancing too. Because finally, healing, a balm of Gilead is being applied to your heart. You have seen injured our soul. It depreciates our energy, our concentration, our consecration. This is the nature of serving repentance. Yes, you write on quotes. So that this pain, this burden, sometimes becomes so intolerable. I recall the first time I read Thomas Wolfson, The Doctrine of Repentance, I was this close to suicide. And I met my principal, Robert Strivens, and he gave me a wise counsel about reading the Puritans, you know, and, 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 and all those stuff. There is an anger that comes into your heart when the Holy Spirit is reminding you. And I'm sure in the mercy of God, those, <laughs> those things that the Holy Spirit reminds you of are but a fraction of the evil you have done. If the entirety of, your, of the weight of your evil is placed upon you, you will crack. But all this very, very intolerable Pain that comes upon your soul leads you to Christ. That is the ultimate end. If it leads you to suicide, it's not or it's the origin. It's not from Christ. It's not from the Holy Spirit. If it leads you to Christ and peace and commitment and growth in grace, it is called evangelical or repentance. Every Christian must have this. And the reason why... Now, I look up. The reason why the, 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 the fathers put the paragraph one and two before this time is that to put a distinction between, before this, that those who, who, who grew up in a, in a Christian home should have some, a bit of this. But their own crisis moment cannot be the same as those who are coming to faith much, much later in the years, when they have done things that they cannot even tell. Somebody is coming to faith at the age of 70, and he says, come and confess his sin. Where, where will he start from? <laughs> where? Where will the 70-year-old start from? Even a 30-year-old now to confess his sin properly, say confess, if you don't confess, and then confess to you. I mean, as even, even you as a pastor, you will fall at one point. If, you, if, if the person is genuine, I start giving you details of the things they have done. At one point, you'll be the one that will fall under the anointing. It is that those who were, so they, they want to make a decision. So people say, ah, but all this thing, I didn't feel it when I was, when I didn't felt it at the point of my, perhaps, yes, it's, 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 it's understandable that children that grew up in a Christian home, in a, in a, in, in a good home, uh, they have not had some body count, no, they have not any, apart from stealing meats from ports, I mean, destroy daddy's remote control and lie about it, and then, uh, uh, what again? What again do Christian children do? Uh, well, yeah, you say you know what you did. Mm? Christian children, most, 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 they won't, Christian children, most of them are saved, prevented from a very scandalous sin. That's what the confidence is. Even those most small sins actually are sins that are worthy of hell. That we are not putting distinction between sins. It's just that at the point of repentance, at the point of coming to faith, their, their crisis moments are not the same. So that those who grew up in Christian home, I remember my own time, I was... I was I, I almost lying about my, because I couldn't really find our, people are giving testimony how they came to faith. And it's so elaborate, like you, details that correspond with what Jesse Rye is talking about. And then you come to my own turn. I, don't, I can't even remember anything. I knew when I became saved, I knew the period, but I can't remember like, 
I was doing this, this, this. I have not experimented anything. I didn't experiment. I, yeah, I did. Was, you know, I have not experimented anything. I didn't experiment anything. I was already a junior choir. I was already uh, feeling my catechism at the age of six. I've read the vernacular Bible at the age of eight. I have I've been a fairly good boy, you know. So if you're going to ask me, if I, people want to say, ah, when are you going to give your life? It's like, come on, just, just give your life to Christ as just like the, you know, to fulfill all, <laughs> all righteousness. Of course, I had my crisis moment. But it will be the degree of those who have spent their, the larger part of their youthful life in uh, lasciviousness. Okay. The, uh, I, thought I, would, I thought I would be with this. Maybe next week we could look at the mark of true repentance. What I'm just to do now is just, just a recapitulation next week, like the issue of awareness of, just, uh, awareness of sin, uh, faith in Christ, godly sorrow, commitment to stay away from sin, and then uh, some lessons that we will, we, we will learn. Now, let me just not, let me, because we are, most of us are fasted, so you won't curse me in your heart. So, one lesson we learned tonight is that repentance is a gift. The same way you did not come to Christ, you did not come to Christ on your own accord. Everything that has to do with salvation must be by way of gift. I hope you understand that. Everything. Jesus is a gift. Faith is a gift. Regeneration is a gift. Everything that, if it's salvation you're talking about, is a gift. So, so, when a non-Christian repents of his or her sins and comes to faith, God has gifted him. God has granted him repentance. And we can say amen to that. And we must tell them, them to know, those unbelievers that walk through the door of the church, that, that you have found something precious than gold and silver. That God has granted you Repentance, their heart that repents. All believers do not repent. All believers just change lane. They are not smoking weed now, they are smoking shisha. They don't even smoke anything again, but they take something else. But they don't take anything again, but they indulge in something else. It's the, the heart that is not converted is called hard heart. It's a stony heart. Nothing penetrates. If you are threatened, we can stop for a while. If, you, if our prestige is in danger, we, we just pipe low. We don't repent. Also, the unbelievers repent from the sins they don't like. That is not in vogue. It does not match their, I'm a banker, I should not be seen. Okay, I just, I just change lens. Okay. But believers turn. To Christ. They turn from their sin and they turn to Christ. Secondly, when believers commit sin, their sins are proper sins. No sinner, go, there's no believing sinner that will go to hell. Those who preach once saved, always saved, do whatever you like, are not preaching the gospel. Once saved, always saved. Repenting. If there's no repentance, because Martin Luther in his 95 thesis against the Roman Catholic Church, he said when Jesus speak about repentance, he wills it that the entirety of the life of believers should be that of repentance, perpetual repentance. Not the one you do every Friday so you can eat Holy Communion. That is not repentance. Not the one you whisper to the ears of your reverend father. Not the one you return to the ear of your pastor. So every thing is, is in the office of your pastor, you repent. And then the pastor says, okay, go, my son. You are, now, you are now free. No. It is a thing that is coming out of your heart, flowing from the pang of godly sorrow. And friends, if you have not known what godly sorrow is, not been saved yet, it must flow from that region. 
And when believers cry out to God to save them from their besetting sin and resting on the supplies of the Holy Spirit, they will receive a gift from God. It is a sign that they are in the covenant of grace. As they hit their head here, they turn back to Christ. As Satan buffets them, trying to lure them, read pigging progress, as things are happening on the way to Zion, there's always a coming back to the path of righteousness. For a believer, there's always a coming back to Christ. There's always a coming back to Christ. Any question? When that happens, you must rejoice that God has given you, has granted you saving. Repentance. Repentance is a gift. Only Christians know what it is. Any question? Now you can understand why author call is not encouraged among us. Do you understand? It's not something like, come now, come to the front now, come to the front now. Say, hey. and then say after me, now you are saved. You start to say, clap, clap your hands. Tell yourself, no, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. The next two months again, you are back at the altar call again. Say, tell yourself you're a child of God. It's not going to happen. The kind of, the kind of fire, the kind of sorrow that God, the Spirit, liquefied into your soul at the point of repentance is so much that you don't want to do it again. Uh, you don't want to do it again. If these things are not happening in your life, if they are not, there's no hatred for sin, sorrow for sin, turning away from sin. You can't be a Christian, my dear, you can't. Easy believism is terrible. Anything, any question, any, any contribution? Is there anything God also whisper to your ears as we're listening to me that you want to share before we go? Yes? Uh, no, sir. Uh, no, sir. Could you just shed more light on um, remorse is not repentance, but probably part of. So obviously, what would cause an unbelieving person to have remorse over his sins? Sorry, I didn't hear that properly. You said remorse is not entirely repentance, yes. but it's I mean, in, in the course of repentance, remorse is there. Yeah. So if Remorse on its own is not part of it. Um, am I wrong to say, I mean, from that quote, that an unbeliever cannot even have remorse or be in a state of remorse over his or her sins? Yeah. yeah. In fact, an unbeliever cannot even have a healthy remorse. The remorse an unbeliever had, the object, the object, or the the propeller of that remorse is himself. Is to the degree that his sin is not affecting him, and what people now think of him, that he's feeling remorse. If your remorse is not because of God, it's not a remorse. It's a very selfish. Of course, as human, we can have remorse. Yes, whether it's a healthy one or an unhealthy one. I mean, if a non-believer does something wrong, they know it's wrong. Our conscience tells us. All we do is, I know, Roman said, we suppress that. If not, there's no unbeliever that can deny lack of knowledge. Why do you think those girls that stand in zone four Tarare, if you check with them, they are not from the they are not from that area. Okay? Many of them are coming from Suleja. Why are they doing that? Why can't they stand in front of their house and, and do that work? Huh? They know. They know it's wrong. Shame, yeah. Apart from shame, they also know it's wrong. They know it's ethically wrong. Yes, they know it's ethically wrong. But knowing that the thing is wrong and turning from it is a different ball game. And know people who, who are smoking and they are coughing at the same time. <laughs> hmm. 
knowledge is not enough. There must be a work of the Holy Spirit that brings a man to life. So the first, that first line is so sweet. So this saving repentance is an evangelical grace, a gospel grace. Whereby a man, by the Holy Spirit, making sensible of his manifold wickedness of his sins, and for the sake of Christ, humble himself, have an abhorrence of himself and a detestation of that sin. Pray to God for salvation and then making commitment by the supplies of the Holy Spirit to stay away from those things that he used to do before. That is what we call evangelical repentance. If you don't have it, what you have, my friend, is what I call, we call it fake belief, fake faith, over time, it will show. It will show. Men that have not repented, see, what happens is that they become atheists along the line. I know of my choir master who is now, who, who, who have masquerade. So, people, people, so it's not that they have lost their salvation. They were never Christians. They were never Christians. They, were not, they, were, they have not been passed through this crucible, this conduit called repentance. If, if by faith you've not come to Christ by repenting and turning away from your sin, you cannot be said to be saved, no matter how moral you are. You cannot say you be saved. Any other clarification before we go? Anything biting you? Is Pastor about to clear enough tonight? You know how quiet and clear and humble I have been before you tonight. This is a, these are heavy matters. That again and again, when I when I when I lay down on my bed and I'm thinking about this thing again and again, I say, ah, oh God. When you put one finger, how many fingers? Not sure. But it's not for us to point fingers, it is that we all turn to who? To Christ. To salvation. And if you even know, say, ah, I think I'm not saved. What do you what, what should you do? What if tonight, having heard this, I don't think I am saved? What do you do? Buy or touch you kill yourself? No. Turn to Christ. Ask him to save you. He will save you. And when he saves you, you will know. Let's pray, shall we? Holy Father, we thank you so much for tonight, for how you've come through for your people. And this truth, even though we knew it before, has been reiterated in our ears. It has been rehearsed again in our ears so that we are without excuse. <laughs> Lord, grant sinners saving repentance. Grant believers saving an evangelical repentance. Cause that our work which will be enriched by the life of humbleness, repentance, and hatred for sin and turn into Christ perpetually. And I pray that this week be a season of feasting upon your word as we come again on Saturday for our conference. Grant John a message to Pastor Mendela from Zambia. Grant that we invite our people, we invite our friends and neighbors that it become like a convocation where we come under the auspices of your word to hear you speak to us on the issue of sanctification. Father, bless this week. Make it a holy week for us and uh, for the sake of your name. Bless us now as we go home. Heal our diseases. Bring us back to yourself. Help us to enjoy peace in our hearts. That regardless of our earthly circumstances, we will rejoice in this fact that we've come to know you and that you know us. And by tomorrow, according to your will and purpose, wake us up to life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.